Here we have a problem from Harvard's math PhD qualifying exam back from 2011, and it's about connected three-sheeted covering space of figure eight. This is a problem that brings back some memories for me, I suppose memories of struggle, where in my very first topology flavored class I took as an undergrad in college, the, the professor actually assigned this as one of the homework problems. And I remember me and my friend staying up, I think, way past midnight trying to decipher actually how to go about approaching this, having to go to office hours. And I remember the write-up for this problem being pretty painful. But now, years later, I dare say I do have a much better understanding of this problem. And I just want to write down or give you a sketch of how you can approach this problem from both an intuitive pictorial fashion and a more categorical say algebraic fashion in a rigorous way. Now, I'm sure many of you watching this video might be even confused on what even a covering space is. And I do admit that this video is going to be peculiar in the sense that I'm going to assume more mathematical knowledge and maturity from the audience. So I will assume you know definition of covering space for most of this. But for those of you that have not taken topology but are still interested in this problem, just so you didn't completely waste your time clicking this video, let me, let me give you a slightly different way of phrasing this problem that's essentially equivalent but uh, much easier to understand. And this should benefit even those of you that know a lot more mathematics, I think, to uh, have this picture in mind. And the interpretation that I'm about to give you, most of it, at least, is something I learned from Hatcher's famous algebraic topology textbook, in case you want to check it out. Anyway, let me start by mentioning that a figure 8 looks exactly like a figure 8. You have one point and you have two circles joining it. And just to make clear the discussion of covering space, we will label the lobes with either a single arrow or two arrows. Now, something to realize is that if I look at this vertex here, we see that in this direction, we move out along a single arrow, and along this direction, going in to the vertex, we're moving into the vertex following a single arrow, and we also see that we move out following a double arrow, and we also move in following a double arrow. So for each arrow and each direction, either going in or going out, we see that we have one of each of the four possibilities. And now a three-sheeted covering space is something that has three vertices, and it's going to have exactly the same property I mentioned for the center vertex in figure eight. For example, this would be an example of a three-sheeted covering space. And you see that if I look at each vertex, we see that we have an edge moving into the vertex following a single arrow. We have an edge moving out of the vertex following a single arrow. We have an edge moving out with double arrow, and we have an edge moving in with a double arrow. So this would be an example of a three-sheeted covering space, and you can check that the same property is going to be satisfied on the other two vertices. So we're really trying to count objects of this form, and here, what do I mean by isomorphism? Well, for those of you that actually know covering space theory, let me just be precise and say, here, when I say isomorphism, when I have two covering spaces, e to b and e prime to b, by isomorphism, all I mean is just a homeomorphism between E and E prime. You don't have to worry about base points here. You're, it's just a homeomorphism that makes this diagram commute. But um, a more informal definition, I guess, in this particular case of covering space of figure eight is to imagine something like this. Let me throw another covering space, three-sheeted covering space of figure eight, say something like this. And now I claim that these two spaces are essentially the same as covering space. And what I really mean by this is that you have one-to-one -one correspondence between the vertices. For example, this vertex, you can identify with this vertex. Uh, say this vertex, we can identify with this vertex. And finally, for this vertex, let's identify it with this vertex. And now, realize that we have a nice one-to-one -one correspondence between, between the edges of these graphs that actually respects the one-to-one -one correspondence of the vertices. What I mean by this, for example, is that if you consider this edge, if you consider this edge, then this edge starts at a circled vertex to a triangle vertex, and we have an edge exactly corresponding to that in the figure on the right. Uh, in particular, I guess it's it's this one, it's, it's this edge. It, it goes from a circled vertex to a triangle vertex, and you can similarly check that you actually have this one-to-one -one correspondence between the edges, uh, respecting these correspondence of vertices. So that that's 
what I mean really by isomorphism or the same covering space. And at least the first part of the problem is asking you to count count on all the numbers of three-sheeted covering space where we count covering spaces like these two to be the same. Oh, and I guess they also really want the covering space to be connected. So I guess I should also mention that it's possible for the covering space to be disconnected. For example, this is a possibility. So here is a possible example. So this entire thing, we see that we have three vertices and you can check the arrows and single arrows and double arrows going in and out condition pretty easily. So this would be an example of a three-sheeted covering space, but it's not connected because we have two components. We have one component here and we have one component outside. Anyway, that should give you some idea of what the problem is asking for. I, can, I guess while we're at it, I can also give you some intuitive idea of what the Galois covering space is. So we're a normal covering space. So here is an example of a Galois covering. You can see it's a three-sheeted covering space. And by Galois, uh, pretty informally speaking, following Hatcher's intuition, is really a space that, that has a lot of symmetry. And here we see that by simply rotating this entire space, say by 120 degrees counterclockwise, we can really make the vertices be indistinguishable. So for, there is such a symmetry based on this rotation that I can really move any vertex to another vertex based on this rotation and no one is going to notice that something, something different happened. On the other hand, we don't have such a nice symmetry for this covering space, which is not Galois, as one can check more rigorously once you know the definition of Galois. Anyway, that probably gives you some idea, some intuitive understanding of what this problem is about. And in fact, uh, I presume that you can actually do the first part of this problem at least based on the intuitive description I've given and come up with a correct answer. And starting now, I will up the mathematical level of this video, I suppose, and, and assume that you know some topology. But before we get started, I want to mention two things. The first is that I will actually not work out the solution completely. What I will do instead is actually give you a theoretical underpinning or background behind this problem that may make you understand this problem much better and provide you with a possible approach that you can use to actually compute the numbers, uh, the desired number of coverings here. But I will leave the actual concrete calculation up to you. And the second thing I want to point out are some references. It's my understanding of this problem owes itself to many different authors. So I guess Hatcher, so fantastic algebraic topology textbook is one of them. But other authors that I'd like to mention here is something like Miranda, Miranda's uh, Riemann surface book, as well as, as well as Lee's Introduction to Topological Manifolds book. And if you want to learn what a monodromy is in the context of, say, Riemann surface or topological manifolds, I suppose these two books are very good ways to get started. Anyway, now let me give you some sketch of how I think about this problem now. So I'm going to give you a chain of bunch of equivalences. So first of all, uh, let's consider a covering space of figure eight, which is S1 wedge S1. So here, of course, we're modding out by the covering space isomorphisms. It's quite well known, if you know some abstract theory, that covering spaces of S1 with S1, or really any reasonable space, is in correspondence with pi1 of the basis action, so pi1 of S1 with S1 action, on the fiber. So here the fiber, also I guess well, let's use three-sheeted covering here, so that the fiber would be a discrete set, one, two, three. And here we're going to mod up by isomorphism of group action. There is probably a better way of saying this. All I all I mean by that is it's a bijection of one to three to itself that's respecting that's respecting the group action given here. And the direction here from going from covering space to pi one of S1 wedge S1 action, this is given by lifting path. So for example, if I have an element of this group and I have one of the points all in the fiber, say point one in of the fiber, what we're gonna do is we're gonna lift this loop to a path that starts at one, and we're going to look at the end point, and that end point is going to be the output of the action. And in doing so, you can easily check that you actually get a group action, and that justifies the way going forward. And the backwards of this one is trickier. Uh, it requires some quotienting argument with the universal covering of S1 wedge S1, or I think that's one way of doing that. But but we will take this for granted that it's well known. And now remember that it, when I have a group action on one, two, three, this is just a group homomorphism. So from pi one S1 with S1 to 
a symmetric group on three elements. So here we have a group homomorphism and remember that pi 1 of s1 with s1, this is one of the most basic examples of say Seifert von Kampen theorem. This is a free group with two generators. And here you can check that the modding out by isomorphism of group action here really goes to modding out, I believe, if you, if you work out the detail, as modding out by composition with a map from symmetric group to symmetric group given by conjugation. What I mean by this is that if I have two homomorphisms from G star Z to S3 and one homomorphism is attained from the other by composing, composing the first one with a map from S3 to S3 given by conjugation with respect to some element, then we consider those two homomorphisms to be the same. So you can check that just going through the definition, I think I did this once in my life, that these two are the same. And once you know this, because Z star Z is a free group, this certainly corresponds to two elements of S3. So it corresponds to a pair of elements sigma tau in S3 times S3. And you can now check that this condition is now going to translate to modding out by simultaneous conjugation. What I mean by this is that if I have sigma tau in S3 cross S3 and I have sigma prime tau prime in S3 cross S3, if I can conjugate, if I can conjugate sigma and tau by a same element, by the same element of S3, and the conjugation actually yields sigma prime and tau prime, then we consider these two pairs to be the same. And this tower of correspondences is really reflected in the examples that we're doing above. So let me just let me just give you an idea of what I mean by this correspondence. So if I look at this very first covering space we were discussing, then this can be seen to correspond to the pair of elements in S3 given by the two cycle 1, 2 and 1, 2, 3. So why does this correspond to 1, 2, 1, 2, 3? Well, if I, well, if you think of these vertices as being 1, 2 and 3 above the base point. Then we see when I lift up this generator of the fundamental group, so this loop with one arrow, then starting at 1, we go to 2. So we go to 2. Starting at 2, we go to 1. And starting at 3, we go back to 3. Then that exactly corresponds to a 2 cycle, 1, 2, which switches 1 and 2 and fixes 3. And you can similarly see, looking at the other generator, so if I look at this loop, and considering the liftings, that we see that this right hand side really corresponds to 1, 2, 3. Not only that, if, if we look at this covering space, we can easily see by a similar reasoning that this corresponds to 2, 3 and 1, 2, 3. And I leave it up to you to check that to go from this permutation, this pair of permutation to this pair of permutation, all we have to do is conjugate by 1 and 3. And the fact that we can go from this pair of permutation to this pair of permutation by simultaneous conjugation by 1, 3 is really reflected uh, topologically, uh, geometrically here in the fact that if I switch the vertex 1 and 3, that's exactly, that you can exactly think of that as being the isomorphism. Like you exactly see that in the sense that if you think of all of these edges as, let's say, made out of strings, then we lift up, we lift up this vertex and we swap its position with vertex 1, then we exactly get this picture on the right. There are a couple more things I want to highlight in this in this chain below. I guess something should be mentioned on how what happens when we require that the spaces are connected, when the covering space is connected. Well, because it's a connected covering space, we know that this monodromy action, this pi1 of s1 which s1 action is actually going to be a transitive action as you can easily check, and this transitive action should require, and I leave it up to you to actually think about what the correspondence is, but this transitivity requirement should also put some constraints on what these two sets or, or the elements of these sets are allowed to be. And assuming that we are only working with connected covering space, we also have this correspondence between the second set or the, or the group actions modded up by the isomorphism of group action, and we have the correspondence two or uh, simply solve groups of pi1 of s1 with s1. And here you want to mod up by conjugation. If I can conjugate a subgroup and get some other subgroup, then those two are considered equivalent. And this is the usual correspondence where when I have pi1 of s1 with s1 action, we can get a subgroup by looking at the stabilizer. And if I have a subgroup of pi1 of s1 with s1, then we can consider all the cosets of the subgroup and if you just consider the group acting on the coset by just multiplication, then that should get you a transitive action. 
on, on the coset, so we get this nice correspondence. And you can check that the isomorphism of group action here, in fact, corresponds to the conjugation of the subgroup on the right. It also deserves to be said that in particular, when, when we have a Galois here, when we have a Galois condition here, on the, co on the covering space, then this actually translates. So when I also require connected, I suppose this will actually translates to the normal subgroup condition. So the normalness of Galois covering actually translates to normal subgroups of pi1, s1, wedge s1. Anyway, that I think the standard theory of covering space or summarized into this, into this giant tower. And this gives you some idea of how to do this problem if you want to do some casework. So something you can do is you can do casework on the cycle type of sigma and tau, and you consider modding up by simultaneous conjugation and see how many such pairs of S3 cross S3 you get. And here, the, doing the casework on the cycle type is quite helpful because, because you know that conjugation is going to preserve the cycle type. And once you do that, checking that it's connected is not too hard. I guess one harder way of doing it algebraically is to figure out what the analog of transitive is all the way down here and check connectedness using that. Or you can, or you can once you make this geometric picture rigorous, you can check it by looking at this geometric picture and see if it's connected or not. I guess the last thing to emphasize is how do you actually rigorously show uh, the galois of the covering. So let me quickly mention that here. Let's focus for a moment on this example and say we want to uh, precisely show that this is not Galois. So let's call this covering space E and let's consider, let's suppose for the sake of contradiction, it is Galois. So if I consider the figure eight, S1 with S1 here, then we have some homeomorphism here, say that's going to take the vertex three here to vertex one. But now when I consider the path or a loop in S1 wedge S1, where a loop just looks something like this by we just wind around this generator once. So if I consider this loop, then and I consider lifting it, so you have this unique lifting up to the covering space starting at three. I'm putting in a condition that when I lift, the lift is gonna start at three, and that exactly gets you this loop whose end point is at three. So we you know, so you know this particular lift is going to end at three. And what is that telling you? That's telling you when I compose, when I compose this lift with this covering space isomorphism, taking three to one. So when I consider this map, this induced map from I all the way to this E, then this particular lift is going to start at one and it's going to end at one. Then that's simply because the three is being taken to one here. But now remember that there is a unique lift of this path to E that starts at one. And when I look at that lift, then the lift we see is going to end up at two. So it really has to end at two, not end at one, and that gets you a contradiction. So this one cannot be Galois. And for the example where we in fact have a Galois covering, so for example here, let's say we have one, two, three, we want to show that there is a homeomorphism of the space to itself, sending, say, vertex one to vertex two, or any one vertex to the other, respecting the covering space structure. And that's, again, very clear in this example by simply using rotation, as we mentioned before. So we just rotate this figure 120 degrees to 40 degrees, and that should really be the end of proof. And I, I've heard from some of my friends that one way of doing this, one way of showing the Galois is to actually figure out is to actually write down the subgroup explicitly and check whether it's normal. But I think, but I think that's a quite annoying thing to do. I, you can try that out if you'd like, but I suppose that's a purely algebraic way of approaching it. But this geometric way should be quite rigorous as well. I think that summarizes everything I want to say about this problem. I do mention in passing that the correct answer for those of you that actually want to try it out and check your answer is that there are seven a uh, three-sheeted covering space, and uh, four of them happen to be Galois. Anyway, I hope this was a nice overview of the covering space theory for those of you familiar with it. And again, I highly encourage you to actually try out the problem if you'd like.